Good morning. If you were here on May 8th, 2004, <laughs> you will recognize what I'm going to share with you today. <laughs> so I wait a long time before I repeat, so that I, <laughs> just in case anybody's checking, uh, checking on me. Uh, it's a privilege and an honor to, to really uh, uh, share the message of our wonderful Savior. A voyaging ship was wrecked during a storm at sea and only two of the men on it were able to swim to a small desert-like island. The two survivors, not knowing what else to do, agreed they had no other recourse but to pray to God. Amen. However, to find out whose prayer was more powerful, they agreed to divide the territory between them and stay on opposite sides of the island. The first thing they prayed for was food. The next morning, the first man saw a fruit-bearing tree on the side of the land, and he was able to eat the fruit. The other man's parcel of land remained barren. After a week, the first man was lonely, and he decided to pray for a wife. The next day, another ship was wrecked, and the only survivor was a woman who swam to his side of the land. On the other side of the land, there was nothing. Soon the first man prayed for a house, clothes, more food. The next day, just like magic, all these things were given to him. However, the second man still had nothing. Finally, the first man prayed for a ship so that he and his wife could leave the island. In the morning, he found a ship docked at his side of the island. The first man boarded the ship with his wife and decided to leave. The second man on the island. He considered the other man unworthy to receive God's blessing since none of his prayers had been answered. As the ship was about to leave, the first man heard a voice from heaven booming, Why are you leaving your companion in the island? He answered, My blessings are mine alone, since I was the one who prayed for them. The first man answered. His prayers were all unanswered, and so he does not deserve anything. You are mistaken. The voice rebuked him. He had only one prayer, which I answered. If not for that, you would have not received any of my blessings. Tell me, the first man asked the voice, what did he pray for that I should owe him anything? He prayed that all your prayers would be answered. For all we know, our blessings are not the fruits of our prayers alone but those of another praying for us. This is, this is too good not to share with obedience come blessings. My prayer for you today is all your prayers will be answered. Be blessed. Take away. What you do for others is more important than what you do for yourself. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from the second book of Kings, chapter 22, verses 1 through 13, and chapter 23, verses 1 through 3. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he ruled for 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedida. She was Adiah's daughter and was from Boscath. He did what was right in the Lord's eyes, and walked in the ways of his ancestor David, not deviating from it even a bit to the right or the left. In the eighth year of King Josiah's rule, he set the secretary Shaphan, Isaiah's son, and Meshuphim's grandson to the Lord's temple with the following orders. Go to the high priest Hekiah, have him carefully count the money 
that has been brought to the Lord's temple and that has been collected from the people by the doorkeepers. It shall be given to the supervisors in charge of the Lord's temple, who in turn should pay it to those who are in the Lord's temple repairing the temple, the carpenters, the builders, and the masons. It should be used to pay for lumber and quarried stone to repair the temple. But there is no need to check on them regarding the money they receive because they are honest workers. The high priest of Kaya told Saphon the secretary, I have found the instruction scroll in the Lord's temple. Then Hilkiah turned the scroll over to Shephan, who read it. Shephan the secretary then went to the king and reported this to him. Your officials have released the money that was found in the temple and have handed it over to those who supervise the work in the Lord's temple. Then Shephan the secretary told the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a scroll and he read it out loud before the king. As soon as the king heard what the instruction scroll said, he ripped his clothes. The king ordered the priest Hilkiah, Shaphan's son, Achim, Micaiah's son, Achbor, Shaphan's the secretary, and Isaiah, the royal officer, as follows. Go and ask the Lord on my behalf and on behalf of all the people and on behalf of all Judah concerning the contents of the scroll that have been found. The Lord must be furious with us because our ancestors failed to obey the words of his scroll and do everything written in it. The king sent a message and all of Judah and Jerusalem's elders gathered before him. Then the king went to the Lord's temple together with all the people of Jediah, Jediah and all citizens of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets, and all the people, young and old alike. There the king read out loud all the words of the covenant scroll that had been found in the Lord's temple. The king stood beside the pillar and made a covenant with the Lord that he would follow the Lord by keeping his commandments, his laws, and his regulations with all his heart and all his being in order to fulfill the words of this covenant that were written in this scroll. All of the people accepted the covenant. This concludes the reading of the scripture.
Once upon a time, a long time ago, a man took off his jacket and put on a sweater. Then he took off his shoes and put on a pair of sneakers. His name was? <laughs> Those are a few lines from the 1998 Esquire magazine cover story entitled, Can You Say Hero? On Friday night, Jim and I went uh, to the theater in Wellfleet to see the newly released movie, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. Um, the film is based on a friendship that resulted at, um, from Tom Junods doing this piece in Esquire magazine on Fred Rogers. Now the film is about Fred Rogers, but it's more about Lloyd, the fictional character that Tom Junod is uh, based off of, the writer character in the film. He is struggling with grief and conflicted family relationships. And as he interviews Rogers, um, he, you know, in the process, is changed by the questions that Rogers asks him as he's asking questions of Rogers. You know, in that loving way that Fred Rogers could ask questions. Um, he cares, and he is able, through these questions that Rogers asks of Lloyd, to help him change directions, to help him confront his demons, to help him move in his life beyond where he's stuck. In our lives, there are people who help us change direction, help us you know, get on the right track at times. Today, our text takes us to the reign of Josiah. Josiah was said to be an ideal king, the greatest of David's descendants. He becomes king at the age of eight years old. Now, when he's about 16, 17, 18 years old, he decides he's going to repair the temple. Josiah was a reforming king. Um, he, he says, you know, we'll spend whatever needs to be to, to repair the, te the temple, whatever it takes. He orders stone workers and carpenters and more to, to renovate. And in the process, they find this book of the law or a scroll of some kind that, um, that seems to have been lost. Um, it seems the law God's blueprint for living a full and blessed life has been ignored or just unknown where it is. Um, when there were kings who led the people away from God. So the priests bring this, this book or scroll and when Josiah hears the book, he, he says, now, here's what the book says. He is convicted. And, it, you know, in dramatic fashion, he uh, falls on his knees and rips his clothes. Um, and he is determined that um, he needs to lead the people, to lead his nation, to lead Judah in a new direction. So core teachings are rediscovered. Josiah preserves these core teachings of God. And when we look closely, we see that God, God's word comes to Josiah through a series of steps and people. The, the book or scroll comes to light during this temple renovation, and then God's word travels um, to Josiah through the priests and the scribe who can decide, you know, who can help unearth what it really says. And then um, there is a part we didn't read because it was a long passage, um, but there is a prophetess, Hulda, a prophetess, a woman, I love that, um, a woman who really most fully interprets the word for Josiah. 
It seems that she has a number of family connections to the palace. So we can imagine that perhaps through some family gossip at a dinner table, she has learned a lot about Josiah and what kind of king he is. And she interprets God's message for Josiah in a way that he gets it, in a way that he understands, in a way that he is his comforted and encouraged. Um, Holda seems, helps him to change course. And in the process, the course is changed for the nation of Judah, for all the people. She is one of many people who play a part in what happens. She helps Josiah hear what God's desires are for himself and for the nation. There's an emphasis on the centrality of the word of God, the centrality of the promise and call of God, including both promises and summons, claimed and redeemed by God, inheritors of God's promise. It seems that what has happened is other gods have infiltrated the worship of the one Lord God. But Josiah manages to find a way to put God first again. Josiah is that rare figure who is willing to change, who is willing to change course for himself and for his people. And Josiah offers us the inspiration for big reversals in response to God. Who are the people who bring God's word to us? Who asks the questions that can help us change course, like Rogers did for, for Lloyd? Who would we count among the community of people needed to bring the word to fulfillment? Is there a, this is a story about all the people who enable Josiah to receive God's word. Who are those people in your life? In the life of our faith community, who are those people? I learned that um, although I didn't get to know her that well, that Muriel Smith, who we um, remembered yesterday in a service, um, was one of those people in the life of this church, that she helped to start the Bible study more than 40 years ago. Uh, uh, exactly appropriate because Josiah was about the word and this Bible study is about gathering people together on Friday to explore the word. And there are countless other saints that you all know more about than I do from this church and through the years. In my life, personally, I think of a, a dear friend, uh, Carol Ann, um, especially this time of year because she is the one who taught me how to cook a turkey. Um, and I had her teach that to me over and over again. It seemed every Thanksgiving while she was living, I called again. Now remind me what the temperature is supposed to be. Um, I think it was an excuse to talk to her. And she also taught me about God's unconditional love for me and reminded me how to find calmness and peace while I was parenting challenging children and feeling at my wit's end. At the end of our text today, there is this proclamation that all the people joined in the covenant. Wouldn't it be nice? Now, if we read just a little further, we learn that all the people didn't really join in. Some kept going their own way. Sound like anything else familiar? They were resistant to changing what they had become comfortable with, what, what, what they were used to, the way they had always done it. How do we live with people who resist change and who love the current system or a way things are done too much to change. When change is really needed, how do we switch the systems that resist God and work with the people who have no interest in changing? Loving them through the changes. What are the joys and pain of change you have experienced in your own journey of faith? 
How can we work with all the people when it turns out that not all of them are interested? Josiah and the people of Judah were living in the middle of a, a world full of competing loyalties. We live with all kinds of forces clamoring for our loyalty. What is it that really matters? What are the cultural things that have infiltrated our worship? Are we worshiping the American flag or the Christmas tree? Or are we worshiping the nation? Or are we worshiping uh, recycling? Or are we worshiping the dollar? Or are we worshiping, you know, keeping up with or surpassing our neighbors and the things that they have? It is Thanksgiving. Who are we thankful for helping us change course when we needed to? Let us lift them up to God in gratitude. Let us thank them if we still can. Later in the Esquire article, uh, Juna tells the story of a boy with cerebral palsy who absolutely loved Mr. Rogers as a boy. But as he became a teenager, he hated himself because of his challenges. He had also been abused by caretakers. He was made to think he was bad because of his challenges. When he became a teen, he would hit himself, and he wanted to die. He would tell his mother through his voice-assisted device, his computer, that he didn't want to live anymore. That he was sure that God didn't like what was inside him any more than he did. This boy loved Mr. Rogers, still as a teen. And Juno tells how his mother thought that if her son could meet Mr. Rogers, it might make a difference in his life but that she lived in California and with a child with so many disabilities, it would be too long of a trip, too difficult to go from California to Pittsburgh to meet Mr. Rogers. So she figured he would never meet his hero until one day she learned that Mr. Rogers was coming to California to meet uh, Coco the, the gorilla, um, but also that through Make-A-Wish Foundation, he was coming to meet her son as well. So let me read this from the article. At first, the boy was very nervous by the thought that Mr. Rogers was visiting him. He was so nervous, in fact, that when Mr. Rogers did visit, he got mad at himself and began hating himself and hitting himself, and his mother had to take him into another room to talk to him. Mr. Rogers didn't leave, though. He wanted something from the boy, and Mr. Rogers never leaves when he wants something from somebody. He just waited patiently. And when the boy came back, Mr. Rogers talked to him, and then he made his request. He said, I would like you to do something for me. Would you do something for me? On his computer, the boy answered, yes, of course, he would do anything for Mr. Rogers. So then Mr. Rogers said, I would like you to pray for me. Will you pray for me? Now the boy didn't know how to respond. He was thunderstruck. Thunderstruck means that you can't talk because something has happened that's as sudden and as miraculous and maybe as scary as a bolt of lightning. And all you can do is listen to the rumble the boy was thunderstruck. And because nobody had ever asked him something like that, ever, the boy had always been prayed for. The boy had always been the object of prayer. And now he was being asked to pray for Mr. Rogers. And although at first he didn't know if he could do it, he said he would. He said he'd try. And ever since then, he keeps Mr. Rogers in his prayers and doesn't talk about wanting to die anymore. 
because he figures Mr. Rogers is close to God, and if Mr. Rogers likes him, that must mean God likes him too. Thank you, God, for agents of change, for Mr. Rogers, for Josiah, for the prophetess Hulda, and for all of those who help us to see more clearly. Amen. <laughs>